Can we cut down the music a little bit? Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study here at Rising Star Baptist Church. It's the first uh, uh, Bible study of the month, I believe. So uh, we're here that you are glad you are with us on July the 6th as we, of course, go before our Lord and Savior um, studying his word. Uh, for those who are taking notes, we will be in... Uh, Daniel chapter 4, verses 19 through 37, that is the end of the chapter, as we are going to get the interpretation of the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and uh, the ramifications of that dream. So we hope that you'll uh, be ready to be with us for that, as always. <clears throat> Naturally, of course, uh, we are beginning our time in prayer. We do have some people in the sanctuary today. And, of course, we encourage you during the summer months, of course, to come on out to Bible study. Um, we have plenty of room, and um, we uh, are encouraging all of our members to come on out. And you can ask questions. You can be involved in the, uh, in, in the study. And so we encourage you to come on out if you can. But if not, we praise God for the technology that he has gifted us with so we can go out over the uh, uh, live over Facebook live and on the internet and eventually on YouTube so you might also receive blessings from the Lord. Okay as always we begin our Bible study with prayer. Uh, we have an exceptionally long prayer list but before we get to that list and read down through uh, the names we will be taking prayer requests from those who are with us this evening. So if you have a prayer request, you can make that known now, and we'll take that before the Lord during our time of intercessory prayer. Elder Brown, if you could keep um, Keith Adams in prayer. He was, he was shot like six times, so keep him in prayer. Amen. Also, I think we already have Renee and Van and... Yes, we and do. And Gary, their son, just keep that family in deep prayer. Right. I uh, To follow up on that, I had a brief chance to talk to uh, Omari, which is uh, Octavia's brother. And he is, he's, he's broken. He is, he is broken. And Gary is broken as well. So we really need to lift them up, A, that God would just comfort them. But they are, they are also angry. And so we know what happens when anger gets in and God is not in control of that. So, so definitely keep them in prayer. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, we have Kena on there and... Uh, Gwen Saunders. And Gwen, correct. Mm -hmm. The Foster family will be funeralizing Mr. Foster on tomorrow. The Foster family, okay. All right. Are there any others? Okay, if not, then let's turn our attention to prayer. <clears throat> Father, the psalmist wrote unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O Lord, my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Father, the four and twenty elders cry out, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Your pleasure they are and were created. Father, in the name of Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we come humbly, Lord, before your throne today, giving you all of the praise, honor, and glory because you indeed are worthy. It was you who woke us up this morning and started us on our way. It was you, Father, who brought us to this place right now, traveling mercies that you allowed us to come over the highway safely. 
You gave us a heart and a desire and a mind to come out into the house of worship to once again praise your name and to make our requests known unto you. We praise you for this corporate time of prayer made possible by the death, burial, and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. We praise you for sending your Holy Spirit to live within each and every believer. We praise you because you've given us the most holy word of God, where you speak to us, you instruct us, you encourage us. We thank you for all that you've done for us just this day. Our prayer is, is give us this day our daily bread. And Father, you have provided that. But Father, you've gone above and beyond all of that. You've given us health. You've given us a measure of strength. You've kept us in our right minds. You provided clothing for us, housing for us, abundant air to breathe. Father, you've done it all. And so many times we take it for granted, but Father, we want to take time out right now to realize and to thank you for all that you do and that you continually do for us. We, your children. We thank you for just being there for us, a comfort for us in time of need. But Father, we can't begin to ask you for anything without confessing that we've missed the mark this day. We have sinned, Lord. We have fallen short of your holy standard. So forgive us, O Lord. You said that if we would ask for forgiveness, that you would forgive and that you would cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so, Father, we hold fast to that biblical promise. And Father, as you have mercy upon us through your abundant grace, we pray, Lord, that we will not make that same mistake again, that you would lift us up, that you would put us back on that road and keep us focused on Christ. Fathers, we continue in prayer during this time of intercession. Our list is, is long, and you know them all, Lord. We pray, of course, for this particular ministry here at Rising Star Baptist Church, that you would bless it, that you would continue to bless it, that you would raise up leaders, that you would raise up those, Father, who would be active in ministry. We thank you for the man of God that you've placed here. Pastor Donaldson, his wife Roz, their son Ken. They've been a blessing. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to strengthen them, lead them, guide them. Give them everything that they need in order, Lord, to praise you and to give you glory. We thank you for their leadership. We thank you for their patience, their kindness, their love. Father, we also lift up Dennis and Kira and their son, Kason, his upcoming surgery, for Bob and Jocelyn Dabney, for Yvonne and Deacon John Clinkscale, for Bo and Dory Crosby, Margaret Ferguson, Jennifer Hightower, Dr. Ben Allison, Gwen Saunders, Kena Pugh and DeAndre, Betty Brown, Pam Clardy. We lift up our own sister, Deb McCray, Mark and Tam Brown, Joyce Callens, Keith Adams, and Father, a particular blessing for those families that are grieving. The Foster family, which will be funeralized here at Rising Star tomorrow the Robinson family and the loss of Atavia, particularly praying for Atavia's father, Gary, and her brother, Omari. Father, they are so angry and so bitter as to what happened. Father, we pray that you would intervene, that you would grant them that comfort that they need. And Father, 
remember, let them remember the words that vengeance is mine, you will repay. No one gets away. You see all and you will bring everyone who might have been involved in this particular shooting to justice. We pray for the Yancey family, Lord, as they continue to grieve their losses as well. Father, we lift up the mass shootings that continue to occur in our nation, it seems, just about every day. We pray for the victims of the shooting here in, in Youngstown. We pray for Keith Adams, who was, was shot. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring that person to justice as well. We pray for the young person who was shot recently, Father, uh, on Tuesday night, and those people that were wounded. Father, you know all about the violence. We know it is an offshoot of sin. But Father, we, we trust you. That's where we began our prayer. We trust you to bring about justice. For you are a God of justice. We continue to pray for the situation over in Ukraine. We know you have children in Russia as well as Ukraine, Lord, and they are suffering and going through unimaginable heartache as war tears their countries apart. But Father, we know that you are in control of that too. So we pray that you would resolve that situation to your glory. Father, we pray for wisdom in not only this church, but others in finances, Lord. Help us to be better stewards of what you have given to us. Let us seek you out before we make any decision that might impact our finances. Let us turn to the scriptures, which has plenty to say about how we should handle the monies that you've given us. Because everything belongs to you. We are just stewards of what you've given us. So help us to be better stewards, Lord. We pray for those who are incarcerated, are Art Carter, we pray for his wife Nikki and their son. We pray for others, Lord, who are behind bars, who have accepted you as Lord and Savior. Father, let them be an example to others that even though they're behind bars, they are free in Christ Jesus. Father, we continue to pray for our school board of which our pastor sits, that they would make wise decisions on behalf of the children that are attending the public schools. We pray for our president and vice president. And Lord, we pray for our mayor, our governor, our council people, our township trustees, our congressmen and women. Father, you have saved people serving in all of these positions. So, Father, use them to your glory to have a positive impact on our nation. And, Father, we pray for our nation. We just celebrated another year that we declared independence from England. But, Father, there's so much more. This country was founded on Christian principles, and we have fallen so short. We've fallen away. But Father, if we would humble ourselves, seek your face, turn from our evil ways, then you will heal our land. So that's what we need to do. And it begins with the household of faith. And now, Lord, bless our lesson today as we take a look at what happens when pride gets in the way. And Father, we realize that you will deal with pride. If Nebuchadnezzar had to learn the hard way, Father, we pray that after we study this today, we will not go down that same path. Thank you for this time of prayer. Bless our lesson now, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, and again, good evening to everyone.
We are in Daniel chapter 4, verses 19, and we hope to be able to get through um, verse 37 as we clear up chapter 4. We are briefly going to review what we uh, studied last week. And for the second time, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. In chapter 2, he had a dream, and his dream um, was significant because he challenged the magicians and the soothsayers and the seers and all of the wise people of, of uh, Babylon to not only tell him what he dreamt, but to interpret what he dreamt. And of course, no one could do this. And so he got frustrated and he put out a, a death warrant <laughs> over all the wise men throughout the province of Babylon. All of them must die because they could not interpret the king's dream, nor tell him what he dreamt. But God showed mercy and favor because Daniel spoke to the person who was supposed to take care of all of these executions, and he says, what seems to be the problem? And he explained it. He says, well, the king had a dream, and he needed to have the dream interpreted, and no one could not only tell him what he dreamt, but could give the interpretation, so everyone's head must go, including Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But again, to show you how God intervened, Daniel asked the, the executioner, give me a moment, and I'll go before the king. Then Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a prayer meeting, and they asked God to allow Daniel to not only let the king know what he dreamt, but to give him the interpretation. And Daniel was able to do that, praise be to God. Nebuchadnezzar at that time praised God and says, there is none like the Most High. But as the question was put out, did that mean Nebuchadnezzar was now going to be worshiping the God of Daniel? <laughs> Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where we found out in chapter 3 that that wasn't so because Nebuchadnezzar then had a, an idol built. And he put out an edict that everyone had to worship this idol. And everyone who didn't worship the idol, when the music was played, they would be cast into the fiery furnace. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, uh, oh, king, live long. Because somebody did drop a dime on him and says, hey, king, do you know those three Hebrew boys, uh, they aren't uh, worshiping. Well, the king was obviously fond of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because he called them in and he says, I understand, it's been brought to my attention that you are not worshiping the statue. And they says, that is correct. He says, well, I tell you what, if you bow down when you hear the music and everything played and you bow down, all will be well. However, if you do not do that, you will be cast into the fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, O king, live long and prosper. But know this, king, we will not bow down. And our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But even if our God does not deliver us, we will not bow. Nebuchadnezzar got hot. He says, fire it up seven times hotter. And they fired it up. And the people who were to cast Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, they got burned up. As the pastor pointed out, there's consequences for being faithful there's consequences, and sometimes there's collateral damage when you're faithful. But we found out what happened is that three men were thrown in, but the king looked in after a while and says, wait a minute. He asked, he turned around and asked his boys, he says, did we not throw three in? 
And now I see four, and the fourth looks like a son of God. Truth be told, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out not smelling of fire. The bonds that they had put on them were burned up. Their clothes were not singed. And once again, Nebuchadnezzar declares, what kind of God is this who can deliver so completely? And then he put out an edict, as we read back in chapter 3 at the end. Anyone who does not worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they will be torn limb from limb and their houses destroyed. So do we think that Nebuchadnezzar now is on board with praising the Most High? The answer, for all of those watching and here, the answer is no. So Nebuchadnezzar has another dream in chapter 4, and we went through that last week, just to briefly re recap it. A tree grows up, and this tree is magnificent. It ascends high above any other tree or any other thing that is known at that particular time. The beasts of the field flock to it and feel safe. The birds of the air rest in its limbs, and it's a beautiful thing. Then an angelic messenger comes down and says, chop this tree down, but leave the stump. Once again, Nebuchadnezzar calls it, now I, I don't understand it. He called in all of his boys again. And again, <laughs> they can't help him. But there's no death penalty for them this time. He's just frustrated. And then he remembers Daniel. In this case, he refers to him by his Babylonian name, Belteshazzar, which means lady save the king or lady protect the king. So... We pull into verse 19 today of our lesson. This is for those uh, coming in and for those watching. Daniel chapter 4, verse 19. Then Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while as his thoughts alarmed him. Now, here was Daniel's dilemma. He knew what he was about to interpret, and he was saddened. In his heart, I believe, and this is just me, so I, I believe that Daniel, who has served for years in the king's court by now, he is now a mature man, had grown to love Nebuchadnezzar, was quite fond of Nebuchadnezzar. But now he had to give Nebuchadnezzar some bad news. Remember the first dream, he says, look, you are going to be strong. Your kingdom is going to be tough. It's going to be great. You are, the, you are the gold figure. You are the, you, 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 you are the big dog. But now there's a problem with this interpretation. And so he was put back. But we read on. The king responded and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation alarm you. So Daniel takes a deep breath. My Lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretation to your adversaries. In other words, what I'm about to say, I wish it was for your enemies. But it is not, O king. This is for you. And so you remember whenever somebody comes over, let me give you an example. You go, you take your car over. To, to the car dealership, you're going to have some work on it, and you see the service technician comes out. And the service technician says, well, do you want the good news first or the bad news? In this case, Daniel's going to give the king some good news first. And so he interprets it. He says, in verse 20, the tree that you saw, which became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful and its fruit abundant, and which was food for all, 
under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in those branches the birds of the sky lodged. Verse 22, it is you, O king, for you have become great and grown strong, and your majesty has become great and reached to the sky and your dominion to the end of the earth. I bet any money Neb was back like this. I am somebody. I am, Daniel, I've been trying to tell you, I am the boss. I rule over all Babylon. I am it. And as we talked about last week, when pride gets in the way, we lose ourselves. We become dependent on us. We think we can do anything. And we don't have to answer to anyone. Remember the key point we brought out last week in our lesson. In order to avoid this trap, we have to remember not to be so self-reliant, but more God-dependent. That was the kernel we wanted to pull from last week. We're going to come back to that again this week, but that's what we want to emphasize. We must become more God-dependent. So in verse 23, in that the king, now remember, this is Daniel. Now remember, the king has seen this angelic messenger come down. In that the king saw an angelic watcher, a holy one, descending from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump with its roots on the ground but with a band of iron and bronze around it in the new grass of the field. And here it comes. And let him be drenched with the dew of heavens and let him share with the beast of the field until seven periods of time pass over him. Seven periods of time is equal to seven years. So, Seven years, king, you are going to be with the beast of the field. He goes on. This is the interpretation, O king. And get this. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord, the king, that you be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place be with the beasts of the field, and you be given grass to eat like cattle, and be drenched with the dew of heaven, and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it on whomever he wishes." Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody had told me that I was going to be eating grass for seven years, I think I might want to change my mindset. I, I think. I would pray that the Lord would show me, you need to humble yourself now before I have to do this. I would pray, and I hope we would all pray, the same situation, but watch Nebuchadnezzar. Keep your eye on Nebuchadnezzar because it is not going to end well in the initial point. Verse 26, and in that it was commanded to leave the stump with his roots of the tree, look what it says, your kingdom will be assured to you after, circle the word after, after you recognize that it is heaven that rules. Okay, so interpretation. Again, Nebuchadnezzar, great ruler, going to prosper. But because of your pride, you're going to be cut down. You're going to have to live like an animal for seven years. But you will be restored to power after you recognize the Most High. Bear with me, because I'm going I'm to bring up another point. 
in verse 27, and this is what I love about God. L listen to this carefully. Therefore, O king, may my advice be pleasing to you. Break away now from your sins by doing righteousness and from your inequities by showing mercy to the poor in case there may be a prolonging of your prosperity. In other words, God is saying, I'm, go I'm going to withhold all of this if you repent. The book of Jonah is the perfect example of this. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh. He says, I'm going to wipe out the Ninevites, but I need for you to go and tell them to repent. Now, Jonah hated the Ninevites. And he said, well, I'm the only one with the message from God. So I'm going to go in the opposite direction. And then God will have to destroy the Ninevites. But we all know what happened. God's plan is irreversible. He shook up, <laughs> had Jonah thrown overboard, swallowed by a big fish. Jonah prayed. He says, oh, okay, Lord, I get the message now. The fish burps him up. He makes haste over to Nineveh. He says, Nineveh, repent. And they repented. Even the animals. And God withheld his verdict. Now we know later the Ninevites forgot about that and God eventually did wipe out the Ninevites. But I like exactly what uh, the commentator from the Dallas Theological Seminary had to say here. Daniel concluded by exhorting the king to renounce his sin, particularly his sin of pride. This points out the principle that any announced judgment may be averted if there is repentance. Daniel urged Nebuchadnezzar to turn from his sinful pride and produce fruits of righteousness, acts which stem from a heart that is submissive to God. Had Nebuchadnezzar done so, he would have averted his seven years of insanity. But did Nebuchadnezzar do that? Class, did we see any hands? No. Any comments so far before we, before we move on? Um, when you said that if it would have been you, you would have hoped that you would have, you know, repented, changed. But he never recognized God for who he was. He, he never did. And because he didn't and couldn't, that didn't move him to any repentance. He had no fear about it, obviously, because if he had recognized God as being king of kings, lord of lords, it would have been different. It would have been different. And this is the thing that we have to remember about pride. Pride blinds us to the truth of God's word. Amen. Pride hardens our heart. That was the problem with Pharaoh. Pharaoh's heart was hardened to the point that eventually God hardened his heart. That was, that was the problem. And what we see here is pride being in the way. And proof of that is this. Okay, so we have the dream, we have the interpretation, we have God's solemn warning. And then he says, if you repent, you can avoid all of this. Okay, so we're all straight on that, correct? Look at what verse 28 and 29 says. Okay, all this happened to Nebuchadnezzar the king. Look at verse 29. 12 months later. Okay, so God had given him a whole year to turn himself around. 
Think about it. Look at the grace of God. A whole year for him to repent of his pride, to do these righteous things, have mercy on the poor, turn away from your wicked ways, acknowledge the most high God that he is the one who has given you the authority. He is the one who has given you the power. Look at what my boy Neb did. Verse 30. Well, verse 29 again. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. Now, if you studied your history back in the day, one of the original 12 wonders of the world were the hanging gardens of Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. So I'm thinking that when he was out on the royal palace, the king in verse 30 said this. Look, he reflected, the king reflected and said, is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? Think about that. He's walking about and says, I did it all by myself. <laughs> Nobody helped me. No, it's all me. I am great. And then look at verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, in other words, he hadn't even finished that sentence. Then a voice from heaven saying, King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is declared Sovereignty has been removed from you. Think about that. Think about this voice from heaven raining down, giving him this message. In verse 32, and you will be driven away from mankind. And your dwelling pace will be with the beast of the field. Think about, look, you will be given grass to eat like cattle and seven periods of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind and bestows it upon whoever he wishes. God's long-suffering and his mercy is unbelievable. Isn't it amazing? Because even, I mean, all of this is going on, but prior to that, he still gave him a promise. A promise. That his kingdom would be restored to him. He's give, with, with all of what Nebuchadnezzar said, all of his pride, all of his arrogance, God still gave him a promise. I'm going to make sure that your kingdom remains and I'm going to give it back to you. Isn't that amazing? That's just so deep to me. That just shows you the grace and mercy of God. He wants us to worship him and acknowledge him. That's all he wants us to do. Realize that all that you have comes from me. Just give me the praise and worship and glory that is my due. That's all I want from you. And that's the message for us today. He wants the praise. And why shouldn't he get the praise? Think, let's flip it over. Amen. Why shouldn't he get the praise? It was he who has provided air for us to breathe. Look, we don't even think about it. But get into a place where there's no oxygen around and find out what happens to you. Think about it. All of us right now have access to water. We don't even think about it. But let us go two or three days without water if we can not going to happen. He does that. He has provided everything that we need to thrive on this planet that we call Earth. That's why he deserves the praise every single day. And when he doesn't get it, when the pride turns in there, he doesn't like that. He's a jealous God. He'll have no other gods before him. And he should be jealous. It's his creation. 
We are his creation. And it's really bad when his children Mm -hmm. act up. The beautiful part in Hebrews, though, is that he'll have to bring out the licking stick, as James Brown had to say. Mm -hmm. For whom he loves, he chastises. That's what we have to remember. Jerry, you had a point? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, He wants it freely given. You know, he's given us to freely give it to him instead of, but he is telling him he's going to get it. <laughs> Regardless, <laughs> you know, it's, it's coming, but he would rather you realize that he is deserving of it. it. That's it. All he wants is praise from his children. And why are we so stingy with it? Why are we so stingy why is it so hard for us to give him praise? Because we're giving it everywhere else. We give it to everywhere else. We, 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 give, it, we give it to every, everyone else. There, there seems to be a difference between praise and just saying good things about God. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar, when Daniel was delivered, He said some great things about God. Absolutely. Absolutely. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were delivered, he said some great things about their God. He did. So you can say some good things about God and not be a God follower. Absolutely. And this is the perfect, Nebuchadnezzar is a perfect example. We have three examples of him praising God to the Most High. And again, I don't want to belabor it, but let's go back and let's take a look at, 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 what, at what he said. This is what he said in chapter 2. And I believe it's around verse 20. I want to say it's around verse 27. No, that's not it. Oh, here it is, verse 46. I was 20 verses off. (laughs) Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel. Well, that was the first thing. When he fell on his face, who did he give homage to? Daniel and did homage to Daniel and gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. The king answered Daniel and said, surely your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries since you have been able to reveal this mystery. But notice what he said here. Surely your God is a God of gods. He was still lumping the most high in with Baal and whoever else they were worshiping. And then he says, and a Lord of kings. So he's putting earthly kings in the same realm as the most high. So he's just saying words. Then, of course, we we remember what happened after Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been delivered from the fiery furnace. And then he said this, verse 28 of Daniel chapter 3. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Look, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Remember, their own god. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks against anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, look at the punishment, shall be torn limb from limb, and their house is reduced to a rubbish heap. Look, inasmuch as there is no other God, and in case you have that, notice that word God is lowercase, lowercase g, There is no other God who is able to deliver this way. So we see that he acknowledges that God is is, is pretty good. Oh. 
Which one? Chapter. Oh, oh, then chapter, and then chapter four. Look, so then he puts out this proclamation. Nebuchadnezzar, the king to all the look, to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth. I'm the big dog. May your peace abound. And look, it has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the most high God has done for me. <laughs> now look, he says, look what the most high God has done for me. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. But did he believe all of that? No, he's just, he's just saying words because we find out that because of his pride and Daniel warns him. You see, that's the beauty about God. God says, you know what, Neb, I've shown you this dream. I've shown you what I can do by delivering Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here's another dream. I'm going to see if you can get it right again. So he gives him this other dream. He tells him how great he is and whatever, but he says the tree is going to be cut down. Hmm. And he says, but I'm going to leave the stump. I'm going to show you some grace. Your kingdom is not going to be taken from you, just your mind, because you are insane if you think that I'm going to let you try to take away all the glory that I've given you, and you're going to claim it for yourself. There's a microphone up there, Sister Blonda. Um, in listening to you, uh, Elder Ernie, um, uh, for the past couple of days, we've been doing a study on true worship. Mm -hmm. And um, John MacArthur's been helping us to understand what is acceptable worship versus what is unacceptable. And he led us to a scripture of how we can honor God with our mouth. So functionally and ritually, we could go through all the motion, even in church. And God is looking to the heart because we can say a lot of things about God but that really not stem from our heart. Amen. And this was Nebuchadnezzar's concern. You would think after seeing what he had seen from the Most High God, I mean, just the fiery furnace itself should, should have just, Nebuchadnezzar could have said, okay, it's over. <laughs> I'm worshiping this. You know, my gods couldn't have done anything like this, so I, I am going to worship the one true God. I'm going to worship the God of, 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 the, of the Hebrews because he is God. But when that pride gets in there, you can't see. And that's what happened here. Verse 33, immediately the word concerning Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled and he was driven away from mankind and began eating grass like cattle. And his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Now think about this. He was going to be in this condition for seven years. And guess who was still ruling Babylon? Think about this. Here's a man who's insane and he's still the king. He is still ruling. They kept him from the people. And I, I like what had been predicted. This is from uh, the commentator from Dallas Theological Seminary. God endured Neb Nebuchadnezzar's pride for 12 months. <laughs> this may have been a period of grace in which God was given Nebuchadnezzar every opportunity for him to repent. But when Nebuchadnezzar ignored Daniel's exhortation, God, who had given Nebuchadnezzar his authority, announced the interruption of his rule. Notice, the interruption of his rule. Not the end of his rule, 
the interruption of his rule. Sometimes God has to interrupt what's going on in us to get our attention. There's a microphone. Okay. Frank, Frank Rupert has one. Uh, my pastor, David Tolbert, always says uh, that God, because of his grace, is not quick to start spanking. But when he starts, he's not quick to stop. I love that. I, I hope everyone heard that over the Internet. Well said. Uh, Brother Teacher, you know, when I read that verse, uh, I thought about uh, King Nebuchadnezzar, and, you know, I find it uh, almost unimaginable that after getting that decree from Daniel that this man didn't change at all. I put him in our position. I put him in, uh, let's say, myself. When, you know, I've done wrong and the Lord punishes me, and I ask God to, to forgive me, and I repent. You know how we do. We, we do good for a while. Uh, and we, we, we change our ways for a little while. And when nothing happens bad, like this decree came about, then we start to get comfortable and we kind of slide back to where we was in the beginning. And so I've, I, to me, when I hear this, I say to myself, well, I perhaps King Nebuchadnezzar did give grace to the poor for a few weeks or for a few months. But after he saw, like you said, his pride took him over. After maybe 10, 11 months, nothing happened. He said, well, you know what? Maybe I don't have to change. Maybe I am as cool as I think I am. And the Lord said, like you said, no sooner than he said it, it was over for him. It was, it was over. Brother Frank. You know, I, I know he kept uh, reneging and, you know, <laughs> after he's seen God working, but I believe at the end of chapter four, it looked like Nebuchadnezzar was, had repented. Uh, uh, to me, he looked like he had repented and he even acknowledged, you know, his pride. He said, he said, God will humble the pride. He spoke this out of his own mouth. Right. And, and so I don't know if we can dogmatically say that he didn't become a believer. Now, I understand he probably had other gods, but he worshipped the God of Daniel. In fact, I'm glad you got there. You, you, you raced ahead of me a little bit because I'm going to put it out there that when we hear this declaration, I'm just gonna put it out there. Do we believe Nebuchadnezzar became a believer? But we'll, we'll put that out there. We'll, we'll put that out there for, for, for general discussion. So the commentator says this, and, 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 I, kinda, and I, I kind of agree with it, but I wanted to let you hear what he had to say, and we can discuss it if you choose to. Elder Brown, real yes, quick, sir. I just, the, the phrase grace period just kind of just rings in my mind, and it's because in, in verse 29, mm -hmm. 12 months later. 12 months later. As opposed to verse 33, immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that. There is a grace period. There's a grace period. And we don't know what that grace period is. And that's why we shouldn't mess around with Absolutely. it. Absolutely. When God gives you grace, accept that grace and, and work on it. But don't challenge him. That's what Nebuchadnezzar did. Goes back to what, what, brother, what brother Hughes said. Two months, three months, four months. Hey, nothing's happened. Five months, six months. Well, Dan Daniel must have been off. He must have been off in his interpretation because it's a full year and nothing's happened. I still am Neb. But immediately, when the words were still in his mouth, that judgment finally, finally came. So, verse 34. Oh, I wanted to read what to come. The commentator believes this. He says, Nebuchadnezzar was hidden in a secluded park, so his true condition could be hidden from the populace. Also, in the king's absence, Daniel may have played a major role in preserving the kingdom and possibly in preventing anyone from killing the king. Now, that's this commentator's speculation. 
But it might prove wise because Daniel was God's man. And since God knew that he was going to restore Nebuchadnezzar to the throne, perhaps in this seven-year period, Daniel had some authority. Because remember, he was now the governor over the province of Babylon. Really second only to the king himself. But anyway, we go to verse 34, and this is what we're coming to, what's going to be the great debate question of the evening. But at the end, look, there's that historical but. But at the end of that period, that seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven and my reason returned to me. Instead of looking at me, he was now looking up. And I, look, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. And then we get to this great portion of scripture. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing but he does according to his will in the host of heaven. That's what Job had to get into his, his mind. And among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? That's the sovereignty of God. And verse 36, and at that time, here we go, at that time my reason returned to me and my majesty and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. And my counselors and my nobles began seeking me out. So look, so I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. Let me read what Chris Hodges, who is the pastor of the church. By the way, I recommend this book for those who might want, want to get it, the, the, the entire title of the book is called The Daniel Dilemma, How to Stand Firm and Love Well in a Culture of Compromise. And the author is Chris Hodges. And again, he is the founding and senior pastor of the Church of the Highlands in Birmingham, Alabama. And this is what he had to say. God always shows us the way back. He's always willing to produce new growth from the stumps in our lives. He points this out. When we do not heed God's warning, our pride causes us to collapse under the weight of our sins. So when the sanity was restored, and for those, again, taking notes, Mr. Hodges or Pastor Hodges says, when we repent, we need to focus on what he says are these three steps. First, we must exalt the king of heaven. God deserves heartfelt praise and worship. Anything less is arrogance on our part. God deserves heartfelt praise and worship. Anything less is arrogance on our part. And I like the analogy that he uses there. He says, he longs for the days when people who go wild at football games and in concerts would go just as wild when they praise the Lord in the church. He says, it still frustrates him when people praise the Lord and they raise their hands and shout their eyes are closed and people roll their eyes over him and look at him and says, what is he or she doing? Yet, he says, when they go to see the Alabama Crimson Tide play, they are like wild people. Got their faces painted with red, wearing their Alabama stuff and going crazy. He says he longs for the day when the church gets ex that excited about exalting our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Number two, acknowledge that God does everything right and all his ways are just. Isn't that what Nebuchadnezzar said? He says, he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Remember, God doesn't ask us to try to understand his ways. He knows we can. So he doesn't expect us to try. He just asks us to obey him and to trust him. And Pastor Hodges says this, it's actually very liberating to trust in something you do not have to understand. That's liberating. Frank, you had a, you had a point. Or, and, and that's why I say again, I mean, Nebuchadnezzar did all this. I mean, he looked to heaven and he acknowledged his sin and, 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 and worshiped God openly. You know, and, and all these things, and it just looked like a repentance. But I think Nebuchadnezzar missed the fact that all along he was God's servant. And, if, and even in other books like Jeremiah, it, uh, God speaks of him as his servant. Yes. Uh, and, and matter of fact, he used Nebuchadnezzar even to overthrow Judah and, and right. Israel and all them. He used, he rose him up to overthrow Judah because of their Sin. idolatry and disobedience and unfaithfulness. He, he, he was God's man for that. He was his servant for that. So I don't know. I mean, toward the end, it seemed like he repented and became a believer to me. We, 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 we're gonna get there, Frank. Let me get to this last point. Then we're gonna throw it out there for, for the audience and for the class to discuss. So, first, we must exalt the King of Heaven. Next, we must acknowledge that God does everything right and all his ways are just. And number three, we must walk in humility. We must walk in humility. And I love this play on words, so I'm gonna say this several times for those who wanna write it down. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. True humility is thinking of yourself less. So I'll repeat that. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Oh, don't mind me, I'm just a speck in the universe. True humility is thinking of yourself less. And so we come to the end when he says in verse 37, now I, getting to what Frank pointed out, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true and his ways just and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. This is what the commentator from Dallas had to say. Nebuchadnezzar did confess that what God had done in dealing with him was right and just. This is certainly not acknowledged by one who continues in rebellion against God. The king also admitted that he had walked in pride be he had been humbled by his experience. This too would testify to a transformation in Nebuchadnezzar's character through a newfound knowledge of God. So, the question, did Nebuchadnezzar actually become a follower of the Most High? Finally. Yeah, I, um, I won't answer that question because we don't know. <laughs> the reality is we don't know because he's made some great 
statements about God before. And so this is another great statement. It seems like you would hope that after seven years of insanity, insanity, <laughs> and he's speaking in first person. Yes, he is. Notice, he, I, yeah, I. And before he was talking about how great he was. Right. But now he's, he's acknowledging God seemingly at a deeper level. But so I don't know. But I think this is saying a whole lot more about God than it is Nebuchadnezzar. Yes. And so, so my question would be, what is this saying about God? And that's not to usurp your question, but that's the question that comes in my mind because we don't know. We can speculate. Well, it sounds like he right. was saved, and um, um, he might have been, but you no. Know, but at the end of the day, what what picture of God is is, is revealed here through this in through this exchange? One of the things that I see, and then we'll go to Dave. One of the things that I see here is that God is long-suffering. Another thing that I see is that God is merciful. Another thing that I see in this is that God wants us to realize that he's sovereign, that he rules and overrules in the affairs of men, has always done it, will always do it. And no one can say, why are you doing this? Dave, you got a point. Um, well, I think that um, God had some plans for Nebuchadnezzar because he could have just killed him, you know. I mean, instead of making him go eat grass and all of that, but I think he had plans for him um, down the line for him. So, uh, like Pastor say, we don't know for sure, but it, it sounds like to me he's acknowledging more than what he did before because before he was acknowledging just himself. That's right. And, and he realized somebody kept him because, hey, seven years, that's a long time to be eating grass. God yeah. kept hey. him even during his insanity. Yeah. Let, let, me tell you what it, let me tell you what it says to me about God, and that is this. The, the, very, the very first sin that we are introduced to uh, uh, when it comes to Satan, was pride. God has a, he has a certain disdain for prideful look and a prideful heart and a haughty look. I mean, that's one of the things that God cannot tolerate. I mean, it, it seems like that is one of his pet peeves, as, as you would say. He don't tolerate anybody thinking that you're more than me. And, and if you think that you are, I am more than willing, able, and capable <laughs> of proving to you that you are not more than me. And he, and, and, it, and he does it in such a way that when he is done with you, you don't have a question in your mind that there's somebody greater than me. Pride to me, God hates it. He hates it. Donna, you had a point. Um, that God is all-knowing. All-knowing. Um, because he said in 26, and in that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree. Mm -hmm. Your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that heaven rules. Yes. He knew it took seven years. He knew exactly what it took to humble him and to bring him to a place of knowing that heaven rules. That's right. So that and that he is true to his word. He's Whatever true. he says it is going to take is play. what it is. That's what it is. Isn't it great to serve a God like that? But you see, all of, all of this is written for our admonition. So we don't make the same mistakes that Nebuchadnezzar made. Lip service to God and, and, and all these great proclamations that we read in chapter 2 and in chapter 3 and in the beginning of chapter 4. All these great proclamations about the Most High, but it wasn't from here. It was here. I want to say, too, that it's, just, it's just scary. So in Matthew, where it talks about 
in that day many will say, Lord, Lord in Lord. your name, I, have, I prophesied in your name. I Cast perform, out demons. I perform all these marvelous works. And then he says to them, I never knew you. It, the, the same heart, they had the same heart yeah. as Nebuchadnezzar had here. Yes. But they really believed they were going to go to heaven. They talking to God, telling him what they did. They really believed that. That is just so scary. And that's why, saints, we read it every first Sunday. Paul admonished the Corinthians, let a man or a woman examine themselves. We, like you say, we could speculate all day whether Nebuchadnezzar came to a saving knowledge of God or acknowledge him. But only you know whether you are following God, the way God wants you to follow him. That's between you and the Father. You could fool me, you could fool Pastor Donaldson, but you can't fool him. He knows. You can deceive yourself. You, you know, one other thing I, I, I see is um, you, you highlighted the fact that uh, Nebuchadnezzar um, was still the king. And so Daniel was in second place. And so our pride at times because of the way that we raise and everybody's racing to be number one. When Jesus was with his disciples and right. they realized that Jesus is going to be gone, they like, okay. you know, who's going who's going who's going to be the, the head Who's going to be the leader? Right. Yeah. And so everybody is it's a race. That's what pride does. It's a race to be number one. But Daniel was in second place in God's grace. And so it's okay to be where God places. You don't have to be the head of something, but you can have as much power, um, kingdom power, where God places you. You don't have to be number one. No. But you can be number one in the position that God puts you in. God puts you in. And if you remember, he put you there for a purpose. So if you fulfill the purpose for which he placed you there, you are a success. You are a success. Sister Blonda, you had a point. Um, as you were talking, I was thinking about the scripture, and it says that um, God is not um, slow concerning his promise, but that he is patient. And he wants those, he, it's not his desire for a man to perish, but a man to come to repentance. So one of the things I see about God, you know, just how patient, you know, he was with Nebuchadnezzar wanting him to turn to acknowledge that he is God alone. Amen. Let, let me close by reading um, from Brother Hodge's book. He says that one of the things that stuck out in his mind was a, uh, a man by the name of Roy Stocksteel in Alabama, or in, I'm sorry, in uh, Louisiana. And he had founded the church that Chris Hodges grew up in and where he was nurtured, where he was mentored. And Roy Stocksteel was one of his mentors. He was the pastor. Well, he went to be home with the Lord, Mr. Stocksteel, and Mr. Hodges, Pastor Hodges had a chance and was given the honor of dealing with his eulogy. And he says, Brother Roy was known for his sayings, and I enjoyed sharing some of my favorites over the years. When teaching on humility, Brother Roy would always say this, if you start your day on your face before the Lord, there's nowhere to go but up. The man on his face can never fall from that position. Think about that. Let me repeat that one more time. If you start your day on your face before the Lord, there's nowhere to go but up. 
the man on his face can never fall from that position. We must learn to humble ourselves before the Lord. That's what James 4.10 says. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. And he will meet you where your greatest need is. Amen? Amen. God bless you. That takes care of chapter 4. Lord willing, we will be in chapter 5 next week. If all hearts and minds are clear, let us pray. Father, again, we thank you for this lesson on Nebuchadnezzar. Father, in the name of Jesus, we've discussed so many things about you, about your mercy, about your grace, about how we need to humble ourselves before you have to humble us. So, Father, let us take these lessons uh, to heart. Let us go back and reflect on it, that we exalt you, that we acknowledge that you are always right and your ways are just, and that we need to humble ourselves before you. Father, thank you for those watching this evening. Bless their families. Bless their family members who aren't saved. Father, perhaps they will show this to them and they'll come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Father, for those here today, we pray that same prayer and also for traveling mercies that we'll be able to go back to our homes and find them, find that home as we left it. We thank you, we praise you, we give you all of the glory because you and you alone are worthy. In the precious name of Jesus, we do pray and give thanks. Amen and good night.